notification. And um, uh, you can permit that, please. We will not uh, you know, use anything against you here. Hi, my name is Siobhan O'Loughlin. Happy to be back with you all beautiful people. Um, if you have been uh, at one of these before, I see some familiar faces. Michael, it's great to see you. Got Yaya, got Gettys, got Micah, hey. Hey, everybody. Um, fabulous. Uh, you can have your camera on if you'd like, and you can um, participate in this Ask Me Anything session uh, in a gallery mode. And that way you can see everybody's responses. It's really fun. People laugh. People's studio spaces, whatever. I think they laugh because I make some good jokes. Watch out. David might have some dad jokes before <laughs> you. Who knows? Yeah, um, probably. <laughs> And you can make that decision uh, for yourself by clicking the view button if you're on a desktop uh, in your upper right corner and you will see gallery or speaker. It might offer you immersive, hopefully not. I don't have an immersive thing to do for you guys today. Um, but so if you choose gallery, you'll see everyone, a speaker, I don't blame you. That means you wanna see my face up close or uh, David and our special guest uh, today. So we haven't been here in a hot minute because um, boy, has anyone caught up from like, you know, holiday experiences and the fact that it's January and January is like still here and no one asked January for its opinion and yet it still continues to have opinions. And I'm ready for February. I don't know about y'all, but boy, 2023 in the house. I like to call this decade the Roaring Twenties because that's what it was before, and it's really the same, the exact same. So um, now you've got your gallery, uh, your gallery or speaker view. Um, we are also here on a, a chat. You will notice that you are muted. It's not that I don't love you. It's just that I can't stand the Zoom chaos. I do not like to be interrupted, uh, and I don't <laughs> like for my panel to get interrupted either. Um, so I uh, I need to control the space in what little ways I can. So that means that you will interact with myself and David and our special guest through the chat. So can people show my new people how we utilize the chat in this space? You can give a little hello. You can holler at me. You can tell me where you're joining us from. You can tell me how you're doing or what beverage you have beside you. Now that we're back on the evening hours, we do love um, uh, 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 an evening social. I certainly do. Um, but maybe I'm kind of the same energy as I am during the day. Who knows? But, uh, so chat it up. Yes. Great. I see it. Hello. Hello. Fabulous. I'm seeing it. We love it. So questions that you will have for David and our special guest will go into the chat and then I will filter it, um, to my panel and I'm going to try to get to all of you. And if I don't get to you, it's not that I don't love you. It's just that, you know, we're only here for an hour. Um, so that being said, um, the chat is something that you can save at the end of this session. So again, if you're on a desktop, if you're on a phone, good luck. Um, and I am not going to try to navigate you through that uh, chaos. But if you're on a desktop, there's an ellipses at the very bottom next to your smiley emoji icon. And you will click that little ellipses and the very top option says save chat. And that is how you will do that. This session is being recorded. We will be putting it on YouTube um, for any friends who are not going to catch the whole thing. Um, if you are watching us retroactively on YouTube, hello, and thank you for joining us. Please remember to subscribe to Edge Studio. Um, okay, I think those are my announcements um, or my sort of uh, uh, instructions to set us up for success. I am your host and facilitator today. I have had the pleasure at this point, I think, of um, educating some of you in some various uh, platforms uh, here at Edge Studio and otherwise, yes, I'm continuing. 70 people, what's up? Great, we love to see it. David, Edge Studio uh, Chief Edge Officer, how are you? I am great. It's so good to be back, everyone. My goodness, I missed to ask me any things. Um, it's great to be back. It's great to uh, see you, Siobhan. And Bill, always good to see you as well. Our special guest, he is very, very special. Um, yeah, it's I'm great. Uh, Happy New Year, everyone. It, you know, here's the question. How long do you say Happy New Year? We're almost in February. Can you still say it? Is it weird? Certainly, it's weird to say in December, right? When, when is the line? Uh, well, maybe that's not important. M okay, I'm sure it's not important. <laughs> <laughs> she used to say until Chinese New Year because she always yes. sends. Oh, there you go. Right? So she's like, I just send Chinese New Year cards. Absolutely. So, you know, so we get a little extension there until Valentine's Day, all of January. Oh, yes. Valentine's Day is coming up. Um, If you want to inquire uh, within with the Edge Studio staff about sending me flowers and chocolates, I will accept uh, any of those um, from anyone. So, okay. Um, happy birthday to Micah. <laughs> Belatedly. 
Um, we love to see it. So yes, yeah, so David uh, mentioned our special guest and actually it's very exciting because we've never had him in almost OMG three years of doing these um, sessions with special guests. Uh, we haven't had him, but he's someone who I have known basically the entire time I've been with Edge, which is actually David a really long time since like winter of 2016. So um, wow. when I was given the info that it would be uh, it would be this person, I was pretty jazzed and I would love to introduce you all to my friend and colleague, Bill Lord. Uh, how are you doing, Bill? Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Everything is good. You know, ha and, and happy new year. And happy new year. <laughs> <laughs> a little late, huh? <laughs> <laughs> got jokes so bill um like i like to do with my people um who are new to the space and welcome to my folks who are totally new really happy to have you um we try to host these events monthly um and we'll be i guess this year this is our first one of the year and it's january so we're already killing it uh and um, we just try to offer this as a community space as a space to hang out see people connect chat and um ask questions to our uh, our colleagues here. And so Bill, um, what I would like to do is, um, I would like to just like, you know, describe you in great length to our people, but I kind of feel like you would be able to tell your origin story more efficiently than I could. And, um, I would love for you now to just like, let us know, like, uh, who you are, what you do and how this all came to be for you in the voiceover world. <clears throat> That's a long answer, but I'll try to make it short. Yeah. I bet. Um, <laughs> So I, I was a radio guy for about 20 years, um, a professional wise guy who uh, was on the radio, um, got out of radio because it wasn't a whole lot of fun, <clears throat> ended up getting married um, and working for my wife. Um, it was it was good work, but I didn't enjoy it. it like, <laughs> like, like, in other words, it, it, uh, it, I earned a lot of money, but I didn't enjoy it at all. So I finally went to her and said, you know, I've got to, I, I, I have to quit. I don't like the boss. And um, <laughs> anyway, um, and um, I want to get the back. The story to will life. be more interesting. What happens after this show? And like, what happened to <laughs> Bill? When, when, he... <laughs> yeah. ah, she knows I'm kidding. But, uh, but yeah, so I was like, I need to get back behind the microphone. She was like, you're going back into radio? I said, no, no way. I didn't want to do that. Um, but I want to get into voice acting because I had done some during my years in, in broadcasting. And, um, but I realized that when you're transitioning from radio into being a true voice actor, um, it's a big difference uh, in your styles and deliveries. So I thought I need to do a little training and I went to Edge. And um, that's how I got started. And then I decided that to become a better voice actor, I needed to become a better actor. And the best way for me to do that was to go into audiobooks because it's so acting intensive. So that's what I did. And um, geez, David, what was that, 10 years ago? Almost nine years ago. Wow. Yeah. 2014, I think. It was a while ago. I know that. Yeah. I think it was 2014. So, Siobhan, have I answered your question? I think so. Yeah. So how did you get into the audiobook world? Like, what did you do? Did you just go shake hands with the writer who hired you right away and gave you a lot of money? That was it, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the wheelbarrows full of cash are still rolling up out. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, man. I made every mistake that somebody could possibly make. Um, I didn't uh, really go out and market myself hard and, and, properly. I just, you know, thought people were going to come knocking on my door and I knew better. Um, so I guess I kind of started with ACX. Yeah, I started with ACX. My first half a dozen books or so were all through ACX. They were all royalty share. Some of them paid out, some of them didn't. But, um, but that was my, my building block. Um, and as I kept training with Edge and, and learning more and more and more, I started reaching out to, I joined the Audio Publishers Association and I started reaching out to publishers and that kind of thing and just sort of uh, built it brick by brick by brick. Mm. Mm. Bill, yeah. can you give a quick overview of the kind of books you narrate, fiction, nonfiction, and even the subgenres within them? You know, so 
uh, fiction, mystery, suspense, thriller, erotica, you know, whatever you can, can you let the audience know what kind of work you do? Because you're so good and you've done so much work in this industry. Well, <clears throat> mysteries and thrillers were my first love because, you know, I'm a Grisham fan and, <clears throat> you know, all that kind of thing. Um, you know, those types of authors, I should say. Um, so I did a lot of mysteries and thrillers. Um, I started getting into science fiction and fantasy, which has been a true joy of mine. Um, there's one particular sci-fi fantasy author, author who I've done probably half a dozen books for, super creative, uh, Robert Tishonik. Um, um, then a couple of years ago, I started doing some nonfiction. You know, I've done some educational stuff um, or books, I should say, you know, stuff sounds so demeaning, <laughs> but uh, um, no, I, I've done some um, educational nonfiction as well as a lot of theology. And, I, you know, like these people are calling me and uh, I had a woman contact me on ACX and offer me an insane amount of money to do a uh, religious novel. Her finished hour, just here's a lot of money. And I was like, is it because my name is Lord? No. You know, I had, I had never done a religious book in my life anyway, but it was fun. It was fun. It was all about angels and demons. And it was kind of like a, a modern day book of Job. I think wow. I should change my last name to technology or something like that. <laughs> yes. Um, I will, I, I feel like, um, there are a lot of there are a lot of wonderful narrators in our industry. Many really wonderful narrators. Mm -hmm. Bill is particularly talented. Mm -hmm. um, he's he's one of the most professional voice actors out there. Which, by the way, Bill also is one of the things that's helped you do so well. Um, without doubt, you read well and you're professional. And and when you get the right combo, the right mix of things like that, it really can happen. There is a lot of work out there. I'll just throw this out there. I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone uh, would ask about this. Royalty shares, mm -hmm. right? You know, a lot of people shy, who, a lot of new voice actors who are getting into the audiobook world, they look at ACX and they think, well, I'm not going to get paid. Uh, it's a, The book is royalty share. And like, if it never sells, I'll make a couple of bucks. It's, it's not worth my time. I have my own feelings about that. I think it's absolutely worth your time because it's a wonderful uh, learning experience and practice and so on. Bill, what are your thoughts on taking a book on ACX that's royalty share and working on it? Even if you think it's a poorly written book and probably will never sell at all, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, so this is actually a very interesting question because I just took my first royalty share ACX book in probably four years, three years, four years. The reason I took it and I'm, I'm going to get back to your other half of that question. But the reason I took it is uh, it's children's literature, which I haven't done a lot of and I love to do. It was so incredibly well written. It's a wonderful story. Um, a quick synopsis. Um, Albie the cat is owned by Professor Wazoom. Wazoom uh, creates this... Uh, doorway to other planets and he walks through and he's gone and Albie the cat is like oh my god who's gonna feed me so he decides he has to walk through the door too and go find Professor Wazoom so he can get his food <laughs> anyway so he gets to this place called uh, Jumbalot and all the animals are jumbled like they're not just okay for example there's a Tricera fox so it's half dinosaur it's half fox Right. So all of these characters are jumboos and jumbalot. Anyway, so um Albie goes and finds Wazoom, saves the planet, uh, gets these warring factions to come to peace with other and you know, uh, happily ever after, meow, meow, meow. Um it's but it's my point is I loved the story and the way it was written and the illustrations and everything about it. And most importantly, the author, Ryan Wakefield, has a marketing plan. So if I'm looking at um, a royalty share book, 
I want it to be well written. I want there to be a marketing plan. I, I just I just want all the pieces to fall together. And if I feel I can um, earn out in maybe a couple of years what I would have uh, gotten per finished hour, I'm all over it. You know, in other words, if I would make three thousand dollars narrating a book and I feel I can generate three thousand dollars of royalties in a couple of years, uh, why not? Because those royalties keep going afterward. And it's it's just a nice passive income. So I'm not afraid to take a royalty share, um, but the pieces have to fall together. And and David, going back to what you said about practice and even if it's not well written, I don't know. I, I I don't want something that I something that I don't feel is a good book. I'd prefer not to have attached to my portfolio. It's an interesting perspective. What about the this is a great conversation for everyone. What about playing devil's advocate here and thinking about the fact that in many other businesses, people who are new to that craft will take on an internship. And in that internship, they are doing the grunt work at a at a company and not getting paid at all. Could you say that working on a royalty share, low quality book is sort of the grunt work and is getting you actually at the mic, doing the editing, forcing you to go through the, the, the trial and errors that come up with your first audiobook, And maybe you'll make a couple of bucks uh, on the back end and maybe not. And, and, you know, we all, I think um, I'll say it this way. I think everyone will probably have a different answer as to whether or not they would take on uh, a book that there's no guaranteed payment. Likewise, I think some people would uh, take on an internship and some people wouldn't. And that's fine. Everyone's different. But there is the opportunity out there. Uh, it's a, and it does, this question typically would, I would expect it to come up at some point. So I wanted to, to broach that. Sure, sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead, Siobhan. Yes. No, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of questions in the chat about this sort of thing and, and ACX. And I mean, how, like, how we get paid is an active conversation and it's important in the world of audiobooks because it is not it varies right it varies on um, the client and the platform how you got the job how you sourced it etc um and i'm just gonna start from the top because that's how we do and it was a question from gettys who is saying and i love this question do i need to take an audiobook class before i create an audiobook demo oh boy <laughs> We'll start with Bill. Mm. Um, I think that, let's go back to the internship. Mm -hmm. You are doing an internship because you want to develop the skills. So it 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 pains me sometimes where I see people uh, on Facebook and social media saying, oh, I just took this contract for my very first book. What do I do next? Yeah. You know, and it's 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 just sort of hard to watch that unfold. It's like they don't there's so much they don't know and they don't know what they don't know, mm -hmm. you know, and and I understand that. But, you know, you really do know how to do some editing. You really do have to know how to act. You have to, you know, there are elements that go into this that you need to know before you start. So, so a class? Yes, I agree. David? Yeah, certainly there is, there are some people who, some voice actors who get into audiobook work and they come from other types of voiceover work, even long form work, like documentary work, uh, long corporate training videos. Uh, e-learning videos, which sometimes are many hours long, and they may have the experience to be able to sort of leapfrog into audiobook. And there still are differences, certainly, in terms of performance and mental, like mental focus and character development and consistency and all of these elements. Uh, so, but some voice actors will be closer. But even in that case, having a class, having a couple of sessions with Bill, like you can all work with Bill. He offers coaching. Um, that is. It will save you so much pain <laughs> because, Bill, like you say, you see on Facebook, people saying, I got my first book. What do I do? We get the calls from people all the time who say, I took my first job. I'm in the midst of it. I'm kind of stuck. Like, I don't know how to edit. 
I, I don't know like how to record like then like how do you help them they're in the midst of that book audiobooks are a beast and in, in a very good way um this t- leads me to a, another conversation that comes up a lot and i think it's very it tied closely and i'll mention this now a lot of people who are new to the audiobook industry and they take that first job say it's not worth the money absolutely not worth the money they're going to pay you just the finished hour and you don't get paid for all of the editing and, and there's so much editing and time that goes into the book the prep work and uh mastering on on the final end but i think it's really important to understand a few things about the pay here one is when you are paid as an audiobook narrator you're typically paid as bill mentioned earlier you're typically paid by the completed hour so let's just say to use a round number you're paid $100 for a completed hour. Let's say it takes you six hours of work to complete one hour. Well, you can do the math. That means you're making about $18 an hour, which is you know not all that much more than minimum wage. But generally, you're going to make a lot more than $100 per finished hour. Maybe it's $150. Maybe it's $175. Maybe at some point, as you gain experience, you get up to $200 to $250 an hour. Also, as you gain experience, you start cutting down how long it takes you to complete an hour of audiobook work. So now maybe you're in a few years, you're making $200 per completed hour, and you can do that in four hours. So now you're making the equivalent, uh, the equivalent of $50 an hour. And these are long contract jobs. A typical book might take you 40, 50, 60 hours. I mean, it's, it's a nice paycheck at the end. And so I feel that a lot of voice actors get that first book. They're completely stuck because they haven't had any proper training. They're not sure what to do. The book takes them a ridiculous amount of time to get through it they don't make enough money at the back end and they put down this industry and i will tell you from experience that the people who typically put down the audiobook world don't understand it well enough and they're not trained it's a it's an amazing world it's a very fun world and if you're the if you have the personality for audiobook work the mental the mental focus the physical stamina if you have these qualities and the other qualities I mentioned earlier, this, uh, the the consistency, the character development, and all of these things, it is a blast. It really, really is. It is for, uh, but it's not for everyone. I mean, I what I'll say just really quickly um, regarding audiobook education is, um, I took Johnny Heller's like audiobook class years and years ago in person at Edge Studio. And I'm a trained, you all know this, I'm a trained like theater performer and on camera person. And I thought I was going to like slay and like, I, I, it was so hard. Like, I, I can't tell you once you're at the mic and you're like with people, if you have a, like, if you just like book the job as David and Bill are sort of suggesting, and suddenly the director is patched into your session and you're reading, I just can't, even if you're like, feel like you're really good at, you know, character work and enunciate all the things that we feel like we need to be at, at audiobooks. I was like, OMG, this is tough. So I really can't recommend it because you really don't like just the sense of like being like in the hot seat doing the job. I mean, you, we read out loud to ourselves, to our partners, to our children. And we're like, I'm killing it, you know, and I bet you all are, but it is so different once you're actually doing, you know, the long form work. Um, Bill, you were going to say something. Oh, um, I, have, I <clears throat> excuse me. I have a student right now who, um, has been a theater teacher um, in a public school system. She has uh, been on stage for a number of years, yada, yada, yada. And she wanted to make an audiobook demo and found out that it was a whole lot harder than she thought it was going to be. Mm. And don't get me wrong, she's a very, very talented actor. She is a great storyteller. I love working with her. It's just so easy. You know, it's like, hey, did you catch that? She says, yeah, I heard it. You know, and then she'll make a correction and and move on um takes direction really well blah blah all that stuff but there are things about audiobooks that are so specific to audiobooks that is completely different from on stage um there was a passage where um the manuscript says um he yelled blah 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 so she yelled blah 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 and it was like ah <laughs> yeah because when you're doing an audiobook it's a very very intimate conversation people are listening in their headphones you know they're they're listening in their bedrooms in their cars it's it's a very intimate thing 
And if they're listening and all of a sudden somebody yells, like literally yells, it's very jarring. And it takes you out of the moment, takes you out of the story. It's like, ah. So even though she's wicked talented, um, there are things about audiobooks that are very specific to this craft, to this way of doing things. And we have to learn those things. Mm. Bill, I was working with someone recently who was in a bind because they were in the midst of a book, narrating a book, and they didn't have proper editing, to, uh, not uh, almost no editing uh, uh, experience. And I taught them the, the uh, like the trick just to clap your hands or use a dock clicker, which may be meaningful to some of you, may not. But once I taught them that trick and explained what it means, the email the next day was, like, holy cow. Yeah, there's your dock clicker. Yeah. Oh, and your edge one. Nice. <laughs> I, <laughs> they emailed me the next day saying, like, that must have saved them an hour alone. Right. It's it's amazing. Um, if you want to build, do you want to explain, like, why the voice actor is going to clap or use a dock clicker or something that makes a, a quick, sharp noise? Uh, when you have your uh, sound file in front of you on your DAW, your digital audio workstation, um, and you make a mistake and you want to be able to quickly figure out where it was. You do that. Did you hear that? Everybody hear that? No, that's not um, coming through for some reason. It's not coming through. No, eh, whatever. Um, it's like, anyway, it's a very loud, quick noise, like clapping your hand. Yeah. So you click that or clap and some people go, <clears throat> you know, there are a hundred different ways to make a noise and it makes a spike in your wave file. So you can very easily come back to see where you need to go and make that edit. Um, I did that for a long time. And then I learned how to punch and roll, which is oh, a even better, yeah. different way of going about it. Um, Dave, do you want to talk about that or? Punch and roll? Yeah. yeah. No, whichever. Um, punch and roll, actually, um, in, in my world, where I come from music, was called... Um, uh, not punch and roll, um, pickups, uh, not even, oh, now I'm just, the word has escaped me. It's a super simple technique. What The point of this, and then I'll explain what the uh, punch and roll means. The point is that the the less editing you have when edit, when uh, completing an audiobook, the better. Because if you make an, a mistake on a 30 second commercial, uh, even if you make, if, you're, if your 30 second commercial is laden with mistakes, what's that, five, six edits, whatever, that's no big deal. But when you're talking a typical uh, fiction story of 10, 10 and a half hours long, you could have a lot of mistakes to edit. And the fewer mistakes you have, the more time you save on the back end, the less editing you have. Uh, so these are we're talking about ways to, to, to um, either speed up editing or eliminate editing. So the dog tricker, the, the dog clicker trick is a way to speed up the editing, right? As Bill said, you can see the a spike in the, the WAV file. You know where to, to fa fast forward to and fix and edit. Punch and roll is great. What you do is uh, in this system, uh, if you uh, are reading your story and you make an error, or even if it's not an error, you just want to go back and re-record something, you roll back your recording, you rewind, let's say 10 seconds or so, you hit play, and then you hear your voice playing back the 10 seconds leading up to where you made the error. You can actually read out loud along with it. So there's two of you at once. And the second before the error, the machine goes into record mode and you just continue on. And what that means is that there's a typically a perfect blend of your previously recorded passage and your new passage. And you just keep on going. And the listener will never notice that. They just won't hear it. Because you're reading out loud along with it before the, the uh, new recording begins, you just blend right in. Your breaths work perfectly. So it's a way to shave off a lot of time off of the editing. And uh, some software, some digital audio workstation software is better at this, and some is not really equipped for punch and roll. Punch-ins. That's what we call it in the music recording, punch-ins. Punch yeah. Yes. Yeah, they're they're geeking out about punch-ins in the, in the chat. Um, yeah. It's been I, so long since I've used that word. It's going way back in my brain to, to get that. <laughs> I want to um, just the 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 chat is a, is a super fun place. And when I said I'm I'm I, when new people are coming in, I'm like, you know, we're hosting a Bill Lord of the audiobook universe um, today. And 
uh, Terrell says, Lord of the audiobook universe. Um, <laughs> and they're very funny. And Amanda says, I can see how theology would fit. Bill has a feeling of thoughtful wonder in his voice, Ooh, which is nice. such a lovely compliment, Amanda. Okay. Amanda, so, where are you? Where are I know. Amanda? Yeah, where is it? You might have to scroll. We got, we got four <laughs> screens going, you know, at least on mine, depending on how you display your, your people. So um, from uh, Bruce, my friend, Bruce says, I've done work for ACX and Libivox. Am I even saying that one right? I don't know about that one. But Lib he says, Libivox. But... Libby, thank you. Do you have any suggestions for moving on to other publishers? Great question. He thinking. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I don't want to open this can of worms, but the reason I'm really hesitating is because when LibriVox is mentioned, you know, now there's this whole AI thing where LibriVox is not protecting people's voices and blah, 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 blah. But so I, I really don't want to if we get into that, that'll be the rest of the conversation tonight. I if agree. we get into AI, and I don't, I don't think we need to go there. We're but, not doing um, that today, at least. So that, yeah, we, we can have something specific for that the upcoming this year, but, but not right but, now. But LibriVox has always been a good platform for people to gain experience. It, it, for those who don't know, it's public domain. You find a public domain book and you narrate it. There, um, um, there are no copyright issues. You just narrate it and put it out there. Um, so whether you're using LibriVox or ACX or whatever, um, it, it's, it's definitely a, a stepping stone to get to the next place. Um, so what's the next place? Of course, you know, working for the publishers is, you know, what everybody really wants to do. Um, but, um, another great option is, um, Learning Ally. Learning Ally provides that. books for people who have visual impairments. Uh, they may be blind. They may have uh, dyslexia. Um, so they do everything from fiction to nonfiction to uh, 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 school textbooks, just everything. And they make it available to people who need that help. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, platform. Um, um, have I gotten off the the track here? Where am I oh, going? No. On this? You're doing great. And I mean, I would say too, like, this is like the hustle that we're talking about right now. Right. And it's like, it's, it's, there is no direct, like, like Bill cannot tell you the direct path, you know, to getting these, uh, these, uh, these other publishers and, and what, what that progression looks like. I mean, on my end, I'm just like, keep letting people know you do this thing. However it is that you let people know what you do put yourself out there. I mean, I've, I say this all the time, but like so many of the, of the voiceover work I get is because I just talk about it like incessantly. I was at a TV writers um, meeting uh, on zoom over the weekend and they were like, Siobhan was so good. She should do voiceover. I was like, y'all here's my website. <laughs> and I have a meeting with someone from that session uh, here in LA next week about voiceover. Right. So like you know, I, I think it's just, and I, and I hate doing it. I would like, don't like promoting myself. I am, um, it makes me like uh, a little bit. And if you feel like that, I just want to say that's normal, but like, at, but like when you make a book through ACX or one of the other platforms, put it out there to your people, like whoever your people are, find ways to be with people. If you're like, I live in a city that doesn't have people, or I don't live in a city, get on the zooms. Cause like they're there and there's ways to do it, you know? So, um, that's my, my feeling. Um, as we, Bill, do you, would you agree with that as well? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And one way that I, um, when I started really progressing and growing, one way that I found projects is I would go to Amazon and I would look through, I don't know, mysteries and thrillers, right? And look for a, a book that I liked that didn't have an audio version. And then I would write the, the author you know, and say, you know, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. The, you know, audio is, uh, you know, one of the growing, fastest growing segments of the publishing industry, blah, blah, blah. And I got quite a few books that way, just by directly contacting an author. And, you know, and, and, and a lot of times I would go to the look inside feature on Amazon, you know, usually get chapter one, and I'd read the first five minutes of the book and send it with my 
you know, my cold call email, you know, and give them a sense of what it would sound like. And I got, I got a pretty fair amount of work doing that. Um, respect the hustle. That is some serious game. And it's like, if Bill can do it, sometimes y'all, when I'm doing this kind of thing, I call it targeted marketing, you know, <laughs> um, if I really can't stand to do it, I set a timer. Or I look at a clock and I say, okay, it's 437, you know, uh, Pacific time. And at 537, I'm going to be done with those inquiries. But I'm going to, I'm going to pound the pavement for an hour and I'm going to like bang some of these out, you know? And I think like ama amazing, Bill, that is wild. And Terry's saying that she did that too. And uh, she got some, some a nibble from, from some of that, that just straight up hustle. So um, we're here to support each other in the hustle, not to overwhelm each other. So um, hopefully this is inspiring to you and doesn't make you anxious. Um, on that, that, that token, I had a great question underneath of that from this. Okay. From Suzanne is audiobook work bill subject to union restrictions, i.e. is it all non-union? Audiobooks are the one thing that SAG-AFTRA doesn't have a piece of the pie of, so to speak. Um, sag afters global rule number one is you do not take non-union jobs, but it does not apply to audiobooks. So we love yeah, it. it. It just doesn't apply. So you can do union, you can do non-union. Uh, I'm a sag after person. Um, I try to do union projects. Um, if I do something through ACX, uh, in fact, this is actually very interesting. Um, a year or two ago, they set something up now where if you take a, um, um, they used to call it a stipend. Um, in other words, oh, it's Royalty Share Plus. So if you take Royalty Share Plus and get $100 per finished hour on the plus, so you get your royalty, you get an extra $100 per hour, you can make that a union job just by the click of a button on ACX, which is just kind of cool. And yeah, as as Terry and Bill are saying, there's both, um, Terry in the chat is saying, um, there's both, there's union and non-union and non -union work um, available in uh, in audiobooks. And I love that. I actually didn't know, that. I'm not sag -Aftra, so I didn't know that, Bill, that it doesn't, like you can be sag -Aftra and do non-union books. I think that's great news. It opens up the possibilities, especially for my newer folks. Um, okay, I wanna jump to um, my friend, Bill Mullaney, from Bill to Bill. Uh, can we create a non-fiction audiobook demo which does not include fiction? Is this okay or crazy? Non-fiction works for me, fiction, non so much. Is that question clear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, let, me, let me make sure I do understand. So yeah. is it okay to make just a, a flat out nonfiction demo or do you really have to put fiction in as well? Is great. That... I think I agree. I think that's the question. Okay. Um, that's an interesting question. If, if you excel at nonfiction, do nonfiction. You know, fiction is not everybody's cup of tea you're, you know, you're, you're creating five or 10 or 20 or 30 characters, you know, which can be quite the challenge sometimes. Um, let's go back to Jumbalot and all the Jumboos, man. I had a lot of voices on that thing. <laughs> They're all crazy. But um, with nonfiction, you have one part to play, and that's the part of the author's point of view. When I'm doing a nonfiction book, I research the author. I, I Google the heck out of them. And one of my first Google searches is the name of the author, author, interview. And I find interviews of the author because it gives me his or her point of view. Sometimes I pick up on who they really are and their sense of humor, which is usually woven into even a nonfiction book. There's always a little something that captures the personality of that author. So if I've researched the author and I get that author, it's easier for me to bring their words to life. 
Um, an example that I've always used is, you know, if you're doing a nonfiction book about the invention of the paperclip, you know, not an exciting subject, you know, for most of us, oh God, the paperclip, you know, but the guy who invented it, it was the greatest thing he'd ever done. It changed the office world. It was a huge thing. And if you pick up on that point of view when you're telling this story about the very mundane paperclip, it brings it to life. So anyway, I've gotten a little off track. If if you want to do nonfiction, uh, I, I don't see why you shouldn't have a nonfiction demo flat out if that's what you want to do. David, I'm curious as a producer, um, uh, how do you feel about the about a solely sort of nonfiction um, audiobook demo? I am very for it. In our world, when we're, when we were casting, the more specific the demo, the better it is for our clients. So at one end of the spectrum, you can have a voice actor who tries to be everything to everyone. Their demo is full of variety, A to Z, and they can get bits of work all over the place. There's the, the possibility that they don't necessarily specialize in any one genre. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you'll have a voice actor who specializes in a very sub niche of the industry, not just audiobooks, not even just nonfiction, but maybe just business help books or just religious books or just educational, just whatever it is. Um, and there's so many voice actors out there who are, especially those who are new to the industry are so scared about pigeonholing themselves, but, uh, Specialists can do very, very well in this industry, as they do in most industries. And um, unlike the paperclip, uh, Bill, one uh, example I often use is just the medical industry, right? In the medical world, there are general practitioners, and they can they can do very well. But then there are also specialists, like a dentist. They just work in your mouth. But then there are special dentists who just work on one area of the mouth, just a certain gum disease or whatever it might be. And uh, and very often, those who have a, a very unique specialty have the longest wait lists. I'm sure many of you have gone through this when you try to see specialists somewhere. You realize you have to wait like three months to see the specialist and you think, but I need you now. Uh, so the same thing happens in our world. If we are casting for a certain type of audiobook and we go out there and we look at all of the voice actors who have audiobook demos and one of them has a specialty demo that showcases just, or focuses just on the subgenre that we are uh, casting, we take that demo into high consideration. The, the, their voice may not be right for the project. They may not be a good actor, we'll find out. Uh, but uh, at least we're gonna listen to that demo for sure. And so you can do very, very well by specializing in one area or having multiple areas. So does this transfer to like fiction? Um... <clears throat> Yes. Do some of your clients want to hear nothing but thrillers and mysteries, and some only want to hear young uh, adult literature? Sure. Yeah. I mean, if we have, I mean, how nice it is for us to be able to say to our client uh, who comes in, for example, with a, a romance novel, and we can say, yeah, you know, we'll send you demos of 10 voice actors. Uh, they, they, well, the, the client's going to say, we want a female or male. We want young, old, but there, there's some general characteristics that are given to us. And then they say, yeah, it's for a romance novel. Well, if we have one voice actor who specializes in romance, that that's the entire demo. Wow. That goes over very well with the, the client and the client thinks we're great because we're getting them a really good voice actor. It's a win-win. And, and there are also a lot of voice actors out there who have many, many demos, very uh, many spe uh, genre specific demos. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, websites out there of uh, voice actors, and they have perhaps a, a film demo, a documentary demo, a commercial demo, a telephony demo, and they have an audiobook demo. And sometimes there are audiobook narrators who have a nonfiction demo and a fiction demo. And there are uh, audiobook narrators who have a romance novel demo and a contemporary classic and a mystery one and a thriller. And, and sometimes each demo is listed on their website. And it makes it really e super easy for us to find the kind of work that we're looking to cast. It, it's fantastic for us. Absolutely. I mean, and as you as you work, you'll find like 
yourself saying like, oh yeah, I can do a super specific um, demo uh, if you've been doing a lot of broad, you know, broad genre. But also, I I mean, I agree with everything that these two are saying that, uh, yeah, like knowing your skill set, like why try to, if you don't feel that your wheelhouse is in nonfiction, like don't force yourself to try to come up with a demo that like you don't in your heart feel good about. Like that's a waste of your time, much less, you know, pe- you know, producers like David um, trying to trying to get through it. I have a question from Michael, which I love Wait, so I'm, much. I'm yes. sorry. I, yes. I just like to throw in one thing uh, because Siobhan, you just said something that is so important uh, about g- kind of focusing on what it is that you want to focus on. Uh, in my career, of, of coaching and, and guiding voice actors in all of these years, there must be hundreds and hundreds of examples when uh, of times when voice actors have come to me and they've said, hey, I, I just want, I just need a consultation. I just need some guidance. I really want to become, uh, I want to become a, an audiobook narrator or a documentary narrator or whatever it might be. And then I'm just not, I'm just not getting there. And I say, well, okay, what kind of demos do you have? They say, I have a commercial demo. And I say, well, well, if you want to become an audiobook narrator or a documentary demo or a corporate narrator, a corporate video trainer, whatever, why do you have a commercial demo? And they say, why isn't that what you need? Isn't that what you need to, to break into voiceover? Um, as Siobhan said, you don't need to put out a commercial demo or any demo that's not in the in your intended wheelhouse. There's no point. It's it's different work. And <laughs> there is almost nothing a similar uh, from the narration standpoint, there's nothing similar in narrating a, a commercial and an audiobook. They're completely different. Other than having a microphone, there's nothing in, in common <laughs> just for the most part. Um, yeah, so you don't need a commercial demo. You should have demos that focus on the kind of work that you want. If you're not sure where you belong in the industry, then you need to work with someone who can kind of help guide you and help you figure out where you might be marketable. Uh, and, and there are a lot of considerations when you figure out what goes into where you belong in this industry. Oh, I'm just reminded of um, an expression. The rich, the 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 riches are in the niches. <laughs> Going back to what I said earlier, by specializing in a, in, a, in a precise niche, sometimes you can really do very well in this industry. Yeah, the riches are in the niches. I heard that recently. I like oh that. my God, that's good. Um, okay, really good question here, which I love um, from Michael um, that I'm tossing over to you, Bill. How long does it or should it take to complete a book. I love it. What's the answer? Whoa, 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 whoa. What do you mean to complete a book? Like to, to narrate, start to finish, soup to nuts? Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> How long is the oh, book? My, my, my first book, a 13 and a half hour collection of a bunch of short stories took me about 80 hours to record and edit and prepare for market. It was insane. <laughs> of course, I work a little faster now. Um, so here's, I'm going to try to say this. I, I, okay. Somebody who's really, really experienced can narrate an hour in about an hour and a half. A lot of folks are about two hours, two and a half hours. So let's start there, right? at least two to one, you know, of uh, narration time versus the finished audio ready for, for final editing. Um, but then it has to be proofed, edited, and mastered. So do you do this yourself or do you outsource that process? If I'm working PFH, I always outsource it. There are sometimes I'm doing some royalty share pluses or something like that, that I'll still outsource it because I end up making more money on a per finished hour book as I'm narrating than I do by spending 16 hours to edit something. Does that make sense? You know what I mean? Absolutely. So, so how long does it take to make a book? My God, that's such a, a hard question to answer. Yeah. The, the, the calculation I get is 6.15. What is that? That's how long it took you uh, per hour, your ratio there, Bill, on your first book. You said 13 hour book. Um, and took you 80 hours. Yeah. You spent 6.15 hours completing each hour of audio. And yes, I'm sure you're way, way faster. Um, there are a lot of voice actors who strive to get like a four to one ratio. So yeah, it takes you two hours to read one hour of audio and it takes you two more hours to edit that. And so you, you have about a four to one ratio. 
And that's nice. That's a nice number to get to. Yeah. And yes, I do know voice actors who can do a, like a two to one ratio because they read cold copy super well. They punch and roll along the way so they don't need to go back and edit. And so a lot of them don't even, this is ridiculous, I think, but they don't necessarily read the manuscript or the book up front. They just go for it. Um, I don't, it's, it's hard to kind of bring as much into the book if you don't know what to expect. Um, which, you know, leads me to a compliment for you, Bill, because uh, earlier in this conversation, I mentioned that one of the things that makes you so great in this industry is that you are professional. And then you talked about your prep work, that you, you when you are given a book, you research the author and you listen to their interviews. Those things go a long way. Those are, those are that, that's one of the many things that just makes you do well in this industry. And there are lots of these things uh, for everyone, lots of things to learn. Lots. Well, so when I um, prep an audiobook, I read it start to finish. Um, all the while I'm making notes. Um, I, I put a spreadsheet together that has all of the speaking characters and I put the characters' names and I put the attributes because, you know, an author gives you a ton of information about every character in a book. You know, she walked into the room, um, you know, with this attitude of this and she was dressed like that and you know they're they're filling in the blanks about who this person is what kind of person it is and i make all those notes um i even have a column that i call their hopes and dreams uh, which may not sound uh, well okay so when you're narrating a book you've got the words but you've also got the subtext which is the meaning behind the words so if I know what a person's, a character's hopes and dreams are, so to speak, it helps me understand better who they are as a character in the book. Um, so that's a very important part of my prep process. Um, I also think of every chapter as like the scene of a play or a movie. Every scene is progressing the story to the end. So. As I'm uh, prepping the book, um, I make a little synopsis of each chapter because I might not get back to actually recording it for another week or two. Um, and then I see there's this little synopsis at the beginning of every chapter. The main character is going to do this or this happens or blah, blah, blah. And it's like instantly it's like, OK, got it. I remember now. And then you know how to tell that story better. Instead this is of just. Great. Bill, Bill, so I have a question for you. Uh, I know we're just about out of time, but uh, hopefully, and it might be a long answer, but I know a couple of uh, voice actors, who narr uh, audiobook narrators, who sort of take a different approach at uh, a fiction story. When they prep the book, they actually mark down where each character comes in and out. So character one is on page 17 in paragraph three and and line two and, and so on. And they, they create this spreadsheet. And then they go back and they record all of each character by itself. So even if there's a character who appears just two times in the book, once in the beginning, once at the end, they go and they record those two things. And at the end of the, all of the recordings, they go and they edit all of the pieces into sequence. Uh, probably takes a lot longer, but they feel like that they get a significantly better, um, more consistent, uh, more consistent characters, better performance. What are your thoughts on that? A, I can see why they would do that. B, I agree. Oh my God, what a nightmare of putting it all back together. Yeah. Um, but really, I think what really sticks with me is when you're in the middle of dialogue, two or three or four people, they're all reacting to each other. And if I just go in and put one character's part down and then three days later I'm doing the other part of that conversation with the other character I, I don't think that that you know the the synergy isn't there uh, you know I, I, I don't know I, I don't think I could do that I don't think it would work for me I could understand where it could work for someone else yeah, I, it is it, the same as you explained. That's exactly what I hear when I listen to their work, because there's not that flow. There's not the dialogue. The, the dialogue is not as natural sounding. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thanks. Just was curious what you would think about that. So I... another thing about characters, very quickly, sorry, Siobhan. Um, so I was taught very, very early on, um, this character you highlight in yellow, this character you highlight in red, this character you highlight in chartreuse. And I did that for a few books. And then I was like, my God, this is so confusing. <laughs> <laughs> all of these different colors and I forgot who the colors were and this is why I've come back to just doing my little synopsis which by the way could include new character coming in you know in the middle of this chapter you know David um but uh um yeah I I, I just uh I very rarely even put a mark on my manuscripts anymore it's it's few and far between and it just makes it much more natural for me. Wow. You know, because um, it's, it's, it's really all about this, the subtext and the emotional connection to the characters and to the story. And it's not just reading words, it's understanding why those words are being said and how to bring them to life. And the more stuff I have on, marked up on a manuscript, the harder it is for me to just organically bring that out. But that's my process. I love process. Really quickly, um, for fun, I have created a poll uh, that I thought, you know, these 80 people might like to engage in just to see because people have been asking, people are chatting, and um, just getting a sense of the community at large. And this is, it says, I do or would Meaning maybe you've never recorded an audiobook before, but you're planning on it and you would hire an editor while you narrate the said book. Can I vote yes more than what we all know how Terry feels? Um, the caps lock, I hate it. And the chat is, uh, uh, is the force is strong um, with us. <laughs> yeah, someone's asking about getting a proofer too, which is a, a great idea for some people. Oh God, I never proof your own work, man. Seriously. If you made the mistake the first time, you're going to think it's right the second time. Yeah, yeah. You have to find an editor who can also proof, ideally. Yeah, yeah. Some editors can, some can't. And I'll, and I'll take this as a quick a quick question as we sort of wrap up here. But Bill, are audiobooks all being done remote like everything else? Have you walked into a studio to record, not your studio, I mean, to record a book um, as of late? No, I mean, there's still some going on. But when when the pandemic hit... Um, all of us remote people were getting so much more work because the people who were normally going into studios couldn't anymore. They didn't have a personal studio. They didn't know how to set up a personal studio. And it took them a while to figure it all out and sort of recover, so to speak. So a lot of us remote people were working more than we had previously. But I think now it's all sort of leveled out to some degree people are going back into studios you know but i would say the majority of the work the vast majority is probably doing and is being done in personal studios yeah david would you agree yes love it i love it when he gives me one answer y'all <laughs> Um, and yes, was the answer to the poll as well. How do you like that segue? Um, so yes, that was 85% uh, of us, um, which means that, oh, you know, for who participated in this poll, because not everybody's on the poll, but um, a whopping eight people do their own editing and y'all are baddies. I see you. I see you editing your thing, not making yourselves crazy. Okay. So um, holy cats, literally the fastest AMA I have ever been in is this one, like in my life, like, and I've been in every one. So I, <laughs> um, which is like, David, has it been like 50 some? Oh my goodness. So yeah, I think it's like, we're in the fifties at this point. So my dear ones, um, uh, what the, the process is currently is that, uh, Bill is coaching here at edge studio. And uh, he is, as you can tell, a, a, just a wishing well full of knowledge um, for you in this uh, career path. So I want to offer you, because you were here at the AMA, uh, $50 off of coaching with him if you are so inclined. And the way I'm going to do that right now is by telling you to um, email this email address here, training at edgestudio.com, and say, I was at the AMA and I want to work with Bill. And Laura has told me that then she will get you in. You can also 
uh, give us a jingle jangle. If you are a phone dialing um, kind of person, uh, three, David, what's our phone number off the top? I know, I know. 212. Yep. 868. Edge, which, yeah, which is 3343. I was like, I know it like backwards, but like, I don't want to like get all numbers confused. Okay, so that is the way. And you're gonna be like, I was there uh, and I want a bill discount. Um, Y'all, thank you so much for spending time with us. I changed my name to Siobhan Princess because I was like, we got lords in here. We got ladies. Uh, I'm a princess, obviously. Um, but truly, um, I'm so sorry for all of the millions of questions we did not get to. This was so fabulous. Do you all like the new time? Uh, um, can we see the hands if you prefer this time than the um, daytime? Okay, okay, great. I think our numbers are showing that you like the time. Thank you. Truly, um, keep coming to these things because we will continue to answer these kinds of questions um, in, in the coming months. I know we didn't get to everybody. I still care about you all and I'm grateful that you are here um Bill any last minute words from you on your end oh gosh um uh, uh, just it has been a lot of fun I've enjoyed this very much it's my first AMA um maybe we should do another one if we have a whole bunch more questions that need to be answered yeah we do we should bring you back in like March honestly because that because I feel guilt I have guilt my, I'm Irish so I suffer um <laughs> but, but, but David and Siobhan thank you very much for for inviting me I truly appreciate it David any last words from you yeah thank you everyone thanks for being here um anytime I see people on this call and I'm you know if here for your career it shows that you're determined, you're dedicated, you're putting, you're doing what you can, and that is terrific. And I'm so happy to that we can offer this opportunity to learn from Bill. Um, I learned a lot, uh, Bill. So thank you so much for donating your time uh, and helping everyone out by answering some questions, great questions and great answers. Uh, so Siobhan, you rocked it as always. You're awesome. And everyone, you're all awesome. Thank you, everyone. You're all awesome. And absolutely. Um, thank you, Bill. This is, as we all know, or if you haven't been here before, when we host people, they are donating their time to the community um, spending with us. Bill, there has been a request if you're ever teaching any audiobook group classes with Edge Studio. I second that request. We can think, get that uh, going. Yep. think we should get that going uh, in the in the spring, which is like very close. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> okay. We can get that going even sooner, I think. I'll, I'll, see, I'll see. I'll see what I can do. I have just a little bit of leverage. Yes, I know. I, let me ask, let me bring that up the chain right there. Um, okay, so <laughs> woo, my people appreciate you. Happy, happy new year. And um, thanks for joining us. Um, thanks for being so kind. And there's been so much kindness and love in the chat. And you all like talk to each other as much as to us. And that is what we love to see. Thanks for being with us. We will be back next month. Oh my gosh, they asked me. February 16th is when we're doing it next month. Um, so same time, uh, evening vibes. And uh, see you there. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we hope you have a great evening. Bye. Bye.